Welcome to Pod Junction Podcast, a show for podcasters who want to use their podcast to grow their business. I'm your host, Sada Fainan, and today I'm joined by Peter Murphy, a successful marketing consultant and seasoned pod- podcaster who not only runs a successful podcast, but also integrates it seamlessly with other media like TV shows and LinkedIn. Peter, welcome to the show. Sadaf, I'm excited to chat with you about podcasts. Yeah, right back at you. Thank you so much. So, Peter, let's start from the top. What inspired you to start your podcast, and how does it align with the goals of your business? The story's fun because uh, it takes me back to a challenging job that I took upon myself um, in the middle of COVID in an industry that I was unfamiliar with, which was healthcare, more specifically long-term care. For people who aren't familiar with long-term care, I'm talking about nursing homes. Mm -hmm. And it happened uh, during COVID. So I couldn't go in and talk to, you know, my customer, to my clients, to my prospects. So the reason that I started a podcast is because I was in a very um, high learning curve, new industry, and there was no way for me to go in and learn from my prospects. Mm -hmm. And the best way for me to do it was to interview CEOs who are experts in their field. Uh, Podcasts made them look good and they would share information for me. So I used the podcast for the first three months to spin me up and know what I was talking about. Now, obviously I approached it very humbly saying, I don't really know anything, but they taught Mm -hmm. me in three months. Oh, wow. That's incredible. So yeah, know. it 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 was it was nerve wracking at the beginning because I thought as a podcast host you had to be the expert in the room. Mm. Now I actually think you shouldn't be the expert in the room. I think the best podcast is a podcast host who does the least amount of speaking and does a better job of listening. Um, but I didn't know that at the time, and that was kind of really what I think made it unique is because leaders were better speakers than I was and they were teaching me and then their social proof and their trust passed off to me um, and I got spun up. That's, that's a really good point because you're right. Um, we, we, we seem to think that we need to be the experts, but actually letting the expert do the talking is so much better for the podcast and also for your own learning, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that had I not done the podcast, I would have been nervous to use the jargon. I would have been afraid to go to conventions. Uh, I definitely would have never done public speaking in the industry. But after I spent you know hundreds of hours on interviews, I then felt comfortable going to conventions. I could hold a conversation over lunch. I could, uh, I became a keynote speaker in the area that a year beforehand, I didn't feel comfortable doing a podcast in. Yeah, that makes so much sense. So you've mentioned conventions. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so in the United States, specifically in the B2B um, even more so in the healthcare, traditional industries still depend upon in-person events, conventions, mm-hmm. con- congresses, whatever you want to call them, summits. And that is very, very strong in the long-term care space. So soon as COVID started to allow us to open um, up to conventions, uh, it was time for me to hit the road. And I think that there were kind of Two things that that happened because of the podcast. One is I made a pitch. I made an aggressive kind of media booklet PDF around my background as a TV host, my background as an entrepreneur, uh, my background as a CNA, a certified nurse's assistant, and then being a podcaster in the industry. And that uh, pitched that out and said, Hey, I want to go to your convention and I want to interview your board members, your keynote speakers, um, your best members, your, you know, your stakeholders, your cheerleaders. And the very first convention I pitched it to, they accepted They're like, this is okay. great. We have this guy who knows how to communicate and he's going to show up and he's going to do live interviews, mm-hmm. some on stage, some in the lobby, some in the boardroom. 
and he's going to repurpose these across all these channels, YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, and he's going to give us, give the content to us where he makes us look great. Because Hedef, one of the things that's great about conventions is a lot of in-person conversations uh, make for unique relationships. But a lot of times you go back to your office and that material that you learn from the convention isn't necessarily evergreen. It doesn't ever get into action because it happened while you were relaxed. Mm -hmm. Well, the podcast, people are sharing these tips with me and it becomes evergreen because we turn it into a PDF. We turn it into a webinar. It stays on the podcast format. We'll write up an SOP and then we'll give it back to these leaders and they can share it with each other. Uh, that was the first thing. The second thing that I think that it, um, I didn't expect, which was me going to conventions, then turned into me getting invited as a keynote speaker. So I did, you know, more than uh, 20 talks at these conventions over, mm -hmm. over two, two years. Yeah, wow. That's another thing is with podcasting is that the, the networking side of things just really blows up. You're really able to get into places that you wouldn't normally have been able to. Yeah, we, I think there was probably, if I were to give away the recipe for success that works for us, and we're now doing the same process with a couple other clients, is go for people who are not influencers in the digital space yet. So they're not, mm -hmm. they, they, they haven't necessarily been on a podcast. They probably haven't been on TV, but they're stakeholders in their community or in their association. So for me in the healthcare space, those are board members. Board members are often leaders of their community, of their state, regional, maybe even national level, but you know, they might be 50 or 60 before the digital world. So they're influential offline, but don't have the place online yet. Mm. And making those people look like heroes on your podcast space um, is beneficial to them and beneficial to you because that person will then open the door up for you. You just have to, when you turn off the recording, you just say, who are three other people in your space that you think that I should interview and make highlight their work? And now they're going to open the door to someone even higher. And eventually you're going to start to share, share um, audiences. The two other people that I think um, I focus on is the event planners at the conventions. So okay. they're often the people doing the legwork. So if you focus on the executive director, you focus on the CEO, you focus on the president, well, you're competing against five other people in the state who are trying to get their attention. But if you speak to the event planner, who's the person who puts together the podcast invites, puts together the sponsorships, puts together who are the keynote speakers, this 28 year old who got out of college four years ago um, is the person who's doing all the work and can open the doors for you and is not nearly as busy as or for people's attention as CEO. And then so once you do those two things, eventually you're going to get a really big name. In my case, mm -hmm. it was the CEO of the largest healthcare association in the United States, the president, and also um, and then the second largest association, we also got her as a president. Once we got those two people, we, you know, we started to get well-known authors. We started to get huge influencers on YouTube and those three kind of elements just spiraled. It was a domino effect in terms of brand awareness for what we were doing. That's really cool. So the three of them are working in tandem. So Peter, you've integrated your podcast with television and social media platforms. What inspired this multi-platform approach and how has it benefited your business? The, the, Inspiration came from the challenge uh, that I previously um, mentioned, and I'll go a little bit more into depth of that challenge, which is the private equity. So we took the private equity company that hired me and the previous CEO to turn around a, a, a troubled company with a lot of churn. Um, we had to rebrand it quickly. We had to do it during, during COVID, and then we had to you know, build up the pipeline, build up the brand for when it would, when we would exit this asset. And the challenge with that was, is we didn't have a lot of resources. We didn't have a lot of seasoned marketers who specifically came from that field. So we had to growth hack. We had to fail quickly, but we had to make sure that any failures that we did didn't affect our brand. So we could fail at tactics 
we could fail at strategies. We couldn't fail at anything related to our reputation. Hmm. So in order to growth hack it, I knew that I couldn't have a podcast that only 20 people would listen to, or only 200 people would listen to. Um, and I couldn't have a YouTube channel that I would only have, you know, 15 subscribers. So everything that we did on the podcast, we had to think about how we could repurpose it across different channels. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the four ish ways that we did that was, newsletter, mm -hmm. backlink strategy, YouTube, and then LinkedIn. And I think LinkedIn's probably the most important. Then I'll just briefly mention SEO because I don't think that most podcasters are thinking about it. But LinkedIn was important for us because our prospects were on LinkedIn. It's important for us because LinkedIn was easy for us to find everybody else's second connections. So to set off what that means um, for, for us is with LinkedIn, if you were a client of ours uh, for the last two or three years, more than likely um, your connections would be potential great prospects for us. Okay. So I could have you on the podcast, then I could scrape all of your second connections, become um, not necessarily friends, because I mean, friends on, let's not friends on LinkedIn, but come connections with all of them. And then when I start to push out your content, they're going to recognize who you are and they're going to trust me and my reputation. As long as my conversation with you is authentic, it doesn't come off as salesy. And the other thing that is helpful on LinkedIn, and, and I find that a lot of podcasters don't take advantage of this, with LinkedIn, you need to apply for the creator status. and. Creator status allows for you to do, to create newsletters. It allows for you to do live streams. And once you start doing that, you can take advantage of the LinkedIn algorithm, which is as soon as you become a connection with someone, your content, your RSS feed is going to be pushed to that new connection. So whatever you're pushed out yesterday, when you and I become a connection today, you're going to see whatever I pushed out. That's the first thing of the algorithm. The second thing of the algorithm is if I am doing live streams like our podcast right now, if we are pushing this out in real time to LinkedIn, it's going to send a notification to all of my connections that Peter is going live right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And what's good about that is people, the email is saturated post COVID area. There's emails have been saturated with people spamming and cold emailing and too many newsletters and so forth. Mm -hmm. So we need to get outside of uh, outside of email. And I think that that's what what LinkedIn allows us to do from an SEO point of view. And I'll make this as quick as possible is for every single guest that we have on our podcast that has mm -hmm. a rank domain of, high, of something higher than 50. We finish the podcast and then I say, hey, would you like for me to write up a great blog for your website that your PR person will have complete ed editorial permissions to make adjustments for? Mm -hmm for you to post on your website. And then of course the guest says, yes, right? They already trust me. They know that I'm yeah. communicate. They've seen my website. They know it's mm -hmm. professional. Why well, write it up? They just send it to the PR person. The PR person publishes it. And now we get a backlink, a do follow backlink that's gonna improve the rank on our website mm -hmm. as well. Wow, that is so interesting. Can I ask you a bit more about the creator status? How Do you have to um, have a company profile for that or page for that? How does that work? You know, I, I haven't done it in quite a while, but I did give some advice to someone yesterday on it. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you what it was when I applied um, three-ish years ago. Um, I knew two people who had applied as a creator status and both of them got rejected. So I did a little bit of research on it. And then I realized that LinkedIn wants you to be creating uh, native videos and content on their profile, on their platform, not sharing YouTube links, not sharing Twitter links, not sharing your blog links. So I just downloaded clips of my podcast video, edited them, and then uploaded them to LinkedIn. I made newsletters. Um, I, I put, made posts on LinkedIn that weren't links to another platform. And then I applied for creator status and I got accepted. Now, uh, as I mentioned, I had two people who were 
bigger creators than, than, than I, and they both got rejected, but I think that they were probably just repurposing content from other profiles. So the person that I gave advice to yesterday, as I said, over the next seven days, upload three clips directly to LinkedIn, share those, um, do two or three different posts and then comment on a couple of the people's newsletters. And then I think that they'll get approved. And, and I think that's pretty much a slam dunk. But the good thing about the creative status is then it allows you to create newsletter and it allows you to suggest people to subscribe to your newsletter. It allows you to uh, uh, tag people in your newsletter. And then obviously the algorithm, as I mentioned, once you go live with something, it pushes it out to your entire audience. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Um, just going back to what you were saying about repurposing content, you were saying um, newsletter, um, backlinks, um, YouTube, and LinkedIn. But about YouTube, do you put out the whole recording on YouTube? Is that how you do it? Or do you um, slice it and dice it into smaller segments? We were doing our content at the beginning off of Zoom. And then we were doing a lot of post-production editing. Uh, as we got further along, we did everything on StreamYard and kind of set it up almost like an ESPN series. And I had tickers and I had boxes and would move people around and I would move things in and out. And then I would just hit, uh, I would just hit go live and it would send that recording directly to LinkedIn and YouTube as if or were live. And because I had done a little bit of, the, I'd done a little bit of the legwork while I was doing the interview, mm -hmm. um, it was professional enough that it was ready to go straight. So I'd put up the entire uh, episode. And then from there, what we do is we, we do clips into reels, right? But yeah. that's something we worry about afterwards. We try to pay yeah. attention to what got the most views and so forth. Okay. So while we're on this topic, um, how do you do the whole production side of things? So once you're done on StreamYard, do you have a team that picks that up or are you involved in that yourself? How does that, what does that look like for you? So we, we help with, uh, as consultants for a couple of different clients who are either using podcasts as guests, mm -hmm. using podcasts as hosts, or a new um, avenue that we're going down right now is like a podcast takeover. So to, to answer your question, it depends on how important podcasts are for them, whether it's a brand awareness play, if it is a middle of funnel, bottom of funnel, you know, uh, more of a sales approach to determine how much word we are using our team for. One client in the investment space, we spend a lot of time on it. So we do pitching. Right now we are, because there's a number of us on the team who are, are actual content creators, we're going to do podcast takeovers, which means that I would come to you, sit up and say, hey, you're amazing at your podcast. Your audience is big. My audience is going to like you as well. Can I come on your podcast and interview you? Because you normally don't get to talk about yourself. You're usually interviewing others. Um, and then I'll talk about you. People are excited to hear about your personal story because they've already fallen in love with your voice, your face the way that you ask questions, but they don't know that much about you. So that's an opportunity for us to share audiences. And we spend a lot more time on, on that one. Now for the, on the production side, on the, on the team side, I would say we spend more time on the LinkedIn distribution and tagging than we do on anything related to audio or video or video editing. Okay. Back to LinkedIn and you brought that up. Um, you were saying about um, new prospects that you, you, you connect with via your um, connections, right? Their, mm -hmm. their, their connections are then your prospects. So um, you strategically share content soon after connecting with new prospects. Mm -hmm. Can you share how you decide which content to share and like mm -hmm. timing in order to get the engagement you want? How do you do, how do you go about that? Yeah, so it's a good question. The way that we normally do it is we cut up our clips uh, for our clients and we put it on some type of tool that tracks, opens and views throughs. So okay. like for, for one client, we use Vidyard and we upload those videos to Vidyard. Inside of Vidyard, we make like sub chapters those subchapters then we send out to 
our database or our client's database and we can tell which are the clips that people in the email click on. So we'll, mm -hmm. we'll send out an email saying, hey, here's an interview we did with Peter Murphy Lewis about how to growth hack a podcast. And then in the email, it'll say, see about how he used it to become a keynote speaker at a convention, see about how uh, he used it to uh, scrape second connections and then push out that information, see about how he growth hacked the LinkedIn algorithm. We'll send that out to a database of 150,000 people. We'll wait seven days. We'll see which is the clip that the clip that got the bit highest view through. So something over 90% and which one got the highest amount of clicks. We'll take that. That's the one that we'll concentrate to push out to other platforms. So we use our database first. And then from that database and from what we get from that email, we'll also push that out to ads. We'll also take those clips that did the best with our organic audience who already knows us and we'll push those out to ads. Right. Okay. So it's finding, um, it's finding those clips, that content that you're putting out in different formats and seeing which one gets the best engagement. Okay. Yeah. And if, if you, if, in, if we worked with a client that doesn't have a large database yet, and so we have, we have a client right now in, in the painting space and we have a mm -hmm. client in the zoo space and we have a client in the bank space, right? If depending on how big their, their database is or how, comfortable they feel testing these mm -hmm. if they don't feel comfortable or their database is small we just test it on ads so we'll okay. you know we'll throw a hundred dollars at um five different clips and within four days we'll know by click-through rate and we'll just put the rest of the budget on the the clip that's doing the best right okay so um about that so you've like you mentioned before that um you know you're, you've introduced part podcasting into a less digital industry such as healthcare. So mm -hmm. what strategies do you use then to make your podcast accessible to these audiences? That, that's a good question. And that took me a while to figure out. I think that there's a couple different ways that we have had success. Um, the, the, the first one is, the, the first one is, the first one is, you can see my son behind me. Um, <laughs> the, the, the first one is taking a landing page that has a keyword in it that our cold prospects or our cold email and recipients will immediately identify with so that they'll want to click on it. Okay. So let's go back to healthcare. So let's say it's set up that you're in the state of Michigan and I'm going to send you a cold email. The likelihood of you opening and clicking on something is slim to none if I can't put into the URL something that makes you feel like, oh, this is interesting. The person knows who I am. Mm -hmm. in, my, in my case, what I did was I created a landing page for every convention in the state of Michigan. And then I would send in that email to you. It would say, so... Um, the company I worked for was Experience Care. So I would put ex experience.care forward slash 2024 um, he Michigan Healthcare Association. And I would send that to you. And you're going to click on it because one, you know it's this year. Two, it's a convention that you go to. Three, it's the state that you live in. You go to that and then right on the landing page, I say, we're coming to visit you and we want to interview you. Immediately, they know podcasts. They trust it. Podcast already as a genre makes sense to people. Yeah. They might not know how to use it yet, but I put a very fast autoplay link in there from YouTube that they'll know right away, oh, this person has spoken to people I know, spoken to people I trust, spoken to people I admire. Mm -hmm. And then immediately in the landing page, we say what else I do. So I'm coming as a keynote speaker or we do this software or this is the solution. So mm -hmm. they trust us because they see us. They don't have to go click and subscribe to something on a Spotify that they don't know, right? Especially in, my, in that industry. Um, and then, and then they, they um, will see what else we offer as a solution. So it connects our, our company brand, what we sell as a solution mm -hmm. to their pain point with the podcast. The second thing that we did would, we would take my most successful webinars or not webinars. We did most of my successful public speaking events. So I taught people how to use LinkedIn at in healthcare 
and I taught people how to use the book Five Languages of Love to motivate their employees and find mm -hmm. staffing. And I also taught people how to use LinkedIn to find uh, entry level certified nurses aides from community colleges. And okay. what we would do is we would take the best keynote speaking uh, programs that I did, and then we would convert those into shorter versions of 15 or 20 minutes on LinkedIn. So I would make mm -hmm. two to three events every single month on LinkedIn and bring that over. And then in that LinkedIn, we would be like, hey, you're only seeing a 20 minute version of all the things that we teach throughout the year. Wait till you listen to this podcast that has, you know, thousands and thousands of people listen to it. It's your peers and they're teaching you how they've solved their problems. So instead of this guy, Peter, that you've never heard of that doesn't know much about your industry, why don't you go listen to the hundreds of peers that you already know who explain how they've solved problems. So because I was trying to break into an industry where nobody listened to a podcast, nobody, mm -hmm. right? Like the average, mm -hmm. the average thought leader, the average customer in my industry was 50 years old. They, yeah. they, they were, if they were using Spotify, it was because they were listening to Leonard Skinner, right? They didn't know how to subscribe to a podcast yet. <laughs> yeah. Right. So if, for example, someone wanted to break into um, the real estate industry, I can't think of a better example, but would like with the same strategy that you've been using, would that apply? How would you approach that? Yeah, the real estate industry is a lot harder because I feel that it's saturated um, and okay. um, compared to older industries. So I believe in I believe that podcasts are still growing to grow, and I would double down, I would triple down into anything that's an older industry, mm -hmm. um, and they're 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 just they're just going to bl blow up, right? I'm, like I'm betting big on podcasts becoming more than just background noise in older industries. Mm -hmm. Now in real estate, so I haven't thought in my mind, but now that you asked me, this is off the cuff. I think from the real estate podcast that I've listened to, because I, I had a real estate um, client for, for, mm -hmm. for a while, I think real estate people talk about themselves too much. Mm -hmm. So they use it as a sales funnel that is so obvious and they don't, and the majority of the guests that I've listened to or the majority of posts I've spoken to do one man or one woman shows where they talk about trends or talk about themselves. I think that if you approached it a lot more humbly and did a lot more listening like you are right now, uh, you would be more successful. And then I would go down, I would probably do the exact same play that I shared with you beforehand, which is go after conventions and go after an older generation of people who aren't in the digital space. So I'd go after board members from the most important real estate associations who might not be that all over the internet, but those people are going to open the doors to you, to, you know, the, the stakeholders, the movers and shakers in, in their industry. That would be my first play. So what other older industries are there that you, that you think are untapped? Uh, anything that is mostly brick and mortar and, you know, still has customer service to dependent upon people. So, uh, banks, in my opinion, are still behind the times when it comes to digital marketing. Um, I would say even uh, like uh, car, car, car lots, car industry. Um, I would say definitely anything in the healthcare space, social work, um, airlines. Mm -hmm. um, if you were selling to an airline, right, and you're or to someone in the manufacturing business and you're having to travel all around the country, you could, you know, 10 X your reach by, you could still go visit people in, you know, in Kansas and Oklahoma and Detroit and Florida and so forth, but you could reach them a lot faster with evergreen material. If you're able to penetrate their ears by getting them to trust you by interviewing, interviewing their peers. Yeah. Um, yeah. Those, those, those are the ones that come to mind. I mean, anything that's in, uh, natural resources, right? Like, mm -hmm. so oil, gas, commodities, I would say, so I, I always, I always say if you're in a boring industry, like if you, if you're, if you're at a bar, um, at the airport and people ask you what you do and your job is so boring and so complex <laughs> that you make up something just to move on to the next conversation, yeah, yeah. your industry is ripe for podcasts. Okay. <laughs> 
If your job is so boring, I feel like you're probably 20 years behind in, ter- in digital media. And that yeah. is right for podcasting because people still care about conversation in those worlds. Yeah. It's not just about clicks. Yeah. Well, I like that. I like that. Thanks for sharing that, Peter. So um, I guess my next question is, what kind of metrics do you look at to, um, to see the, the growth of, of your podcast in terms, not just in terms of audience, but actually the bottom line? Yeah, I, I get that question a lot from people who are thinking about doing their podcast or when I have... Um, Re- referrals reach out to me and you know they say hey i'm thinking about doing a podcast i heard about you what should i do i'm worried about you know throwing a hundred thousand dollars at a podcast this year and not seeing any return on the investment mm-hmm. i tend to see podcasts as kind of th- three main metrics that i'm look at probably the first most important is pipeline right mm-hmm. like chris walker who's who's a big marketer in our space and a big proponent of podcasts is make sure that your lead magnet form or your contact form in your side of your HubSpot on your website does not make people answer a pre a a template rather let them ask how they first heard about you. And then when you talk to them, when your SDR talks to them or your discovery call say, what is it that made you finally reach out to us? Like what, what is the last impression that made them? And I think that if you run a successful podcast for six months, maybe nine months, and by successful, I mean you do it every single week, you follow the steps that you guys teach on this podcast, you follow some of the ideas that I shared here for growth hacking across other channels, you should start to see people trickle into your pipeline who say that I've either first heard about you on a podcast or I booked a call because I heard you on the podcast. So either it's bringing people in or it's bringing people to a call. Um, And then the the second metric that I think that you could pay attention to after about 12 months of running a podcast is your sales cycle should be shorter. So what I did with, with a previous, with a client was I would take clips of their podcast interviews Mm -hmm. and push it out to everyone who hit the pipeline. So as soon as you move from an MQL to an SQL, and then you now have, you're in the pipeline for a $25,000 deal or a $250,000 deal, I'm going to remarket case studies to you and podcast interviews to you until Mm -hmm. you close. And that should shorten the sales cycle. So instead of my average sales cycle of being two months, for an enterprise SaaS uh, product, uh, I want I want to get down to six weeks to four weeks, mm-hmm. and I am certain a podcast can do that. I saw it, I did it. So those two things are the two metrics that that we do with our podcast and with our third and and our clients. And lastly, and this isn't near this isn't quite as quantitative as you were asking, uh, but I think that you should be able to see some type of some type of conclusive metrics around brand awareness. So you should either see your YouTube channel grow in subscribers when you're pushing it out as a LinkedIn uh, newsletter. LinkedIn will give you the metrics of who are the people who are reading your newsletter. It'll tell you what their job role is. So in my newsletter, uh, I look for about 15 percent of the people who should be reading my newsletters are CEOs. So those are okay. decision makers. Another 15 to 30 percent should be C-suite executives. So mm-hmm. just underneath that CEO. And that's good metrics. Those are good metrics for me. And then you can see every single person who subscribes, right? So I launched a LinkedIn newsletter uh, a month ago that is repurposing our podcast content and our blog content. And mm-hmm. we hit you know, 1,200 LinkedIn subscribers within one month. And the majority of those are CEOs and C-suites. So that might not show up into the previous metrics I mentioned, which is pipeline or even sales cycle for for quite some time. But there are enough indications that's headed in the right direction. Like if a client comes to you and says, hey, I I, I brand awareness, that's too vague for me. Well, I mean, Mm -hmm. then like when you go to a convention and you speak to 15 people at at the happy hour, don't count that as good marketing either then. 
okay? Because you yeah. know what it is, right? <laughs> it's, it, it, it's not in your pipeline, but you just met 15 mm -hmm. people who recognize who you are and you know what their pain mm -hmm. point are and you know what they think about and you know what next, the next convention they're going to. Mm -hmm. That's such a great point. How often do you send um, newsletters out? Is that a monthly thing? Or a weekly? We're doing it. Do it? Uh, we have two. We, we, the client I'm working with right now is in the investment space, and we are on two sides of the marketplace. So we need portfolio managers and we need investors, and we're in the private equity space. And so we run two newsletters twice per month, two, okay. two per month for investors, where we are showing mm -hmm. them the digital assets that we are acquiring and investing in and why we are buying them at lower multiples and how we can make them efficient and have a yeah. positive outcome um, on when we exit. And then on the other side of the marketplace, it's operators, which are portfolio managers. Those are people who are gonna manage our assets when we acquire them. And we're doing a newsletter around events and conventions that they should be going to. Uh, and we're doing that twice a month. And both of those, okay. the, both those newsletters started a month ago, and both of those mm -hmm. hit more than a thousand subscribers in the first month. Oh wow! So, do you have any stories, any success stories of your own, where your when your um, your sales cycle is a lot shorter, and you've had someone walk through the door and want to sign up? Yeah, it, it was uh, with the private equity company where we did yeah. the turnaround project um, in the healthcare space. We we saw our our leads, um, you know, five x after a year of running the podcast. We saw mm -hmm. our sales cycle move from four months down to three months down to two months. Uh, we had warm leads coming in saying, hey, you know, I met Peter at a convention. I heard your podcast. I heard Peter interview X, Y, and Z person. Um, and then we also used the podcast with people in our pipeline. So if you were in our pipeline and you're actually a good guest, we're not going to use it to close a deal, but you're actually, you're, you're going to help us. And if we show you how great your work our work is, you know, the more likely you're going to trust us. And so if we, we shortened our sales cycle and grew our pipeline mm. to give you, to give you a, a hard, a hard metric. We grew from we rebranded within three months of me starting as the CMO uh, at that healthcare job. And within a year and a half, we went from zero website visitors to 25,000 website visitors uh, because of our SEO work, because of our brand work, and because of our podcast. So you can imagine what 25,000 people on your website look like in your pipeline after, after some hard work. Yeah, that's incredible. And uh, very aspirational as well. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, what are some of the challenges you've faced in your podcasting journey and more so like in, you know, in current times? Are there challenges that you're, you're facing and how are you dealing with them? I f so I'll give you some funny stories um, okay. from, the, from the beginning. The, the challenges from the beginning, if you're doing your podcast the first time, is you feel really clumsy and clunky for two or three months. Uh, you feel imposter syndrome, you overstructure interviews, you prepare way too much, you organize questions into a format that are the way that you think, but not the way that you talk. Um, and I did all of those things. I did all of those. I, I, I did a perfect 10 dismount on all of those mistakes. Uh, Today, I don't do any of those. I, when I do podcasts, I prefer, pr prepare minimally for that. So, for example, for this podcast as a guest with you, uh, I listen to uh, a podcast with you and Matt. Uh, and I'm like, oh, the, you know, these, these people are lighthearted. These are, they're, they're fun. They're funny. You can make mistakes. I don't need to worry about anything. All I need to do is make sure I did, did, uh, deliver value and based on who I can know you're delivering your podcast to, I, I'm like, oh, I feel comfortable talking about this, which is an old industry and how to growth hack it with LinkedIn. Um, other challenges I would say is getting your first big guest is, is hard. Um, but I feel like I shared kind of my recipe to success for that, which is going to people who are not already famous online, but they're great mm -hmm. offline. Uh, and then going after not the top not the top of the food chain, go after the event coordinator, right? Go mm -hmm. after, instead of going after the CEO, go after the CMO to be on the podcast. 
um, and then just get get one or two good names, and those people will open up the door to the others. That was that was a challenge for me as well. Uh, I, I'll show another challenge, which is people who overthink post production. Okay. Decent quality microphone with an authentic interviewer who cares about his or her guests is a lot more important than cutting out my uhs and ums, my mistakes, my awkward silences. Yeah. You know, I can tell from the way that you interview, you care about my answers, you care about the questions. If you did no post-production on this, I don't think it would affect your reach whatsoever because you're a good, you're a good host. Thank you. No, but I, I see your point about the, the heavy production. Yeah, I, I understand where you're coming from because the, the content is so much more important. And actually, I was laughing when you were saying about um, your first challenge of like the, f the first few that you do, how you overprepare and all that. That's exactly where I'm at right now, so I get it. <laughs> is there anything else, Peter, that comes to mind? Yeah, I think I would wrap it up for somebody for somebody who... For somebody who is thinking about starting a podcast or they've started but they need they, they feel like it's a waste of time or they're not doing a good job. I think I think that you need to imagine that your that your morning coffee, like imagine you're sitting down, which is what most of us do in the morning. We have our coffee, we have our breakfast, we usually listen to a podcast right? Mm -hmm. Or some type of YouTube channel. That content in our ears is so perfectly tailored that it's made um, for us to think about, to start a conversation. That content that is in my ears in the morning or that content that's in your ears in the morning could be designed, developed, created, curated by you. All you have to do is make sure that it's valuable. And my opinion, since I'm usually not the expert in anything that I speak about, right? I'm a marketer who translates complex ideas into simple concepts. I'm not an expert. Yeah. I'm just a translator. Is making the guest deliver valuable information. So mm -hmm. if you're stuck, if you're about to start, don't worry. You don't have to be the smart person in the room. If you're mm -hmm. stuck and you start because you can't think of if this is going to have a good return on investment, trust me, if you deliver the value, having someone put their headphones in their ears while they're having coffee and breakfast in the morning and hear your, your advice as the vehicle to the value that they are consuming each day, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's immeasurable on how valuable this can be. Just, just do it. And if you don't have the budget, just start doing it on YouTube and LinkedIn for free. And then follow some of the ideas that you'll hear on this podcast. Wait till you see the pipeline have a difference and then turn it into professional service. Oh, thank you. That's, that's great advice. One of the things I like to ask my guests, Peter, is, um, and you might have already touched on some of this, but I'm still going to get you to do this. So in 60 seconds or less, can you tell us why you think podcasting is a great marketing tool to grow one's business? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to bet big on podcasts becoming more than what blogs were in the 2000s. They're going to be front and center. They're going to be intimately woven into our daily routines, just like I shared with your coffee, your donut, your cereal. Um, podcasts, podcasts are here to stay. I like that. I really like that. <laughs> so Peter, it's been incredibly insightful learning about your journey and your strategies. Um, I feel like you've, you've given us so much value here today. Thank you. My pleasure. Where, where can our listeners find your podcast and follow your upcoming projects? Yeah, so I've got a lot of pod, uh, projects going on. I just filmed a documentary. I'm currently traveling across the United States filming a my fourth TV se um, season and podcasts, um, developing several different podcasts and a YouTube channel. The easiest way to find what I'm doing is LinkedIn. It's uh, I'm the only Peter Murphy Lewis <laughs> on LinkedIn that you will find. Uh, my pictures are funny, my banners are funny, and that's where I share all of my content. Awesome. We'll add that information to the show notes. And to our listeners, thank you for tuning in to Pod Junction Podcast. I hope today's episode inspires you to think creatively about how you can leverage podcasting for your own business growth. 
Be sure to check out Peter's podcast and the links will be on, on the show notes. If you found this episode helpful, we'd love for you to leave a review or share it with someone who could also benefit. I'm Sada Fain, and thanks for listening. Bye for now. And that brings us to the end of today's episode of Pod Junction, where business meets podcasting. If you've enjoyed the insights from this episode and want to grab the show links, head over to podjunction.com. And while you're there, we'd love for you to sign up to the newsletter too. Whether you listen while on the go or in a quiet moment, thank you for letting us be a part of your day. Remember, every episode is a chance to gain insights and to transform your podcasting journey. So keep tuning in, keep learning, and until next time, happy podcasting.